clients and friends. I want to do an update and we've been talking about uh, our research regarding have we gotten to the bottom and is June 13th the bottom and we said well it looks like it was a bottom and uh, <clears throat> well I just want to share some insight and some research that we've been doing and we're getting more comfortable with the idea that maybe it was the bottom and, and especially the evidence we're seeing in in uh, some of the stock prices and stuff but I wanted to go over this chart with you and it's something I did a few years back but it wasn't on YouTube so I wanted to talk about interest rates and and how they influence uh, the investment community so interest rates are a way to um, compare different in income producing investments so if if, uh, if if one bank would said uh, for a fifty thousand dollar CD we will pay you two thousand dollars a year and another bank said uh, for a a a uh, hundred thousand dollar CD we will pay you three thousand dollars a year you would be like well which one's better and um, you when interest rate will make that easy because on, on a hundred thousand dollar CD that's going to pay you three thousand that would be three thousand over hundred or three percent and a fifty thousand dollar CD that paid you two thousand would be two thousand over fifty thousand or four percent then it's easy oh I would rather have the one that's paying four percent so the interest rates let you compare different income producing investments and the calculation is income divided by price okay and it's quoted as a percentage and so that's a language that that we all understand we all understand that uh, the higher the interest rate the more income you're getting on that investment for the same amount same price okay so if we look at bonds and we'll start there because that's the easiest one their income is called dividends and the way they measure that is called the yield okay and if you look at bonds historically over a long period of time a normal or fair interest rates on good quality bonds has been five to six to seven percent let me give you an example here so here's the 10-year Treasury rate this is going back to the 1870s and <clears throat> it got really low at the start of World War II and then it got super low uh, uh, went to zero for COVID but on average it's been about five to seven percent well about five um, shot up here if you take take out the highs and the lows the average is in that five to seven percent range okay so this would be normal if you could ever get um, high quality bonds paying you eight to nine to ten percent that'd be phenomenal you'd be really excited about that and when rates fall in the two three four range it's not that exciting this is you know normal like for example a long time ago when I was much younger uh, I was a three six three banker meaning I like to uh, our, our goal was to borrow it borrow at three lend at six and be in the golf course by three and so I was on the golf course one afternoon getting in nine holes and I was just by myself so they put me with this guy and and he said uh, you know we started talking and he's like so what do you do and I say well I manage investments and so here's what he said well I got all my money in, in eight and a half percent high quality muni bonds so basically he said don't try to sell me nothing kid you know what I mean because he knew he had a very attractive yield on high quality tax-free bonds and there was probably not anything I could do that would um, do better than that so and he understood that he when that opportunity came up he locked it in for as long as he could like 30 years so that's what you want to do when you see rates that are this attractive and um, when I say attractive cheap and safer I don't mean 10% is attractive 9 is cheap and 8 is safer I mean this range 8 9 to 10 is attractive cheap and safer okay so you could look at it as, as being attractive you could also look at it as being cheap and you could also look at it as being safer because 
there's not a lot of fear that rates are going to go up much higher from here. Um, the tendency is for them to move back towards yellow, right? And then when rates get down in this range, um, it's very unattractive. You could also call it expensive, meaning, um, and you'll see what we mean expensive when we talk about real estate and stocks, or riskier, because the risk is that rates are going to want to move back to this normal, fairly price neutral range. Okay, so let's continue that and looking at real estate. Real estate is also an instrument that generates an income. That income is called rent or also for commercial property net operating income, right? And they measure that by a cap rate, which is basically an interest rate. And interestingly, if you look at cap rates historically, they would also fall in this same category that 5 to 6 to 7% is, is pretty normal um, cap rates. If you are able to buy real estate in the 8 to 9 to 10 cap rates, you're really excited because you're getting it cheap, um, it's safer, it's very attractive, and it doesn't happen that often, okay? So when you seize that opportunity, you feel pretty good. And then as cap rates start getting into 2 3 4%, meaning for the same amount uh, of money, you're getting less rent. That's what that means. That means if you invest $100,000, you are only getting 2000 in rent or 4000 Once you start getting 5 6 7 you're starting to feel pr pretty good. 8, 9, and 10 is extremely good, okay? So this is unattractive, it's riskier, because the tendency is for, um, this would indicate that prices are very high in real estate relative to the rents, and, and it could possibly mean that it's going to come back up, <clears throat> meaning prices are going to go down relative to rents, and you're going to get back into this normal range. So same thing for stocks. Now, stocks uh, are, are shares of a corporation, and corporations have earnings, and um, the way those, the earnings are measured uh, is a P-E ratio, which is uh, something that Benjamin Graham came up with back in the 30s when he started to look at stocks. He was the first one, actually, to look at stocks and analyze them similar to how bonds would be analyzed. And for some reason, he thought it a good idea to put this interest rate measurement upside down. You see how the calculation for interest rates is income divided by price? He came up with a P-E ratio, which is the price divided by earnings. So it's backwards. It's, well, it's actually really upside down. So when we start talking about P-E ratios, they're really just an interest rate. They're just calculated in a different language per se. It's like if I say caballo or if I say horse, it's the same thing. It's just in a different language. So so let's take these PE ratios and translate them back into interest rates. So a PH ratio of 10 would mean for a price of 100 you're getting income of 10 or a 10 PE. Would be the same thing as a 10% interest rate. See how 10 over 100 is just upside down version of 100 over 10. Okay, so these PE ratios, if we correlate a PE ratio to an interest rate, so it's in the language that we're more familiar with, P ratio of 10 would correlate to an interest rate of 10. PE ratio of 11.1 .1 would correlate to an interest rate of 9. 8% is like a 12.5 PE, 7% is about a 14. 6% is about a 16.7 PE, 5% is a 20 PE, 4% is a 25 PE, 3% is a 33 PE, and 2% um, is a 50 PE. Okay, now interestingly, stocks historically, in, in this 14 to 20% PE ratio, is would be considered normal, fairly priced, neutral, average, when you see stocks trading in the 10 to 12 PE, that's very cheap, very safe, very attractive. When you see them up in the 25, 33, 50, 100 PE, that's very rich, very expensive, very risky, and, and, and somewhat unattractive, okay? Now, why 
<coughs> excuse me, if, wouldn't you say that, and we're talking about high quality bonds, <coughs> high quality real estate and high quality stocks. <coughs> Excuse me. So as closely as possible, we're comparing not apples to apples, but, but as close as we can. Why would people expect the same income from bonds as real estate? <coughs> Wouldn't you say that real estate is a little bit more risky than bonds? Yeah, you could see you could see real estate prices go up and down, and there's more uncertainty um, in real estate versus bonds. So why do they trade it in in similar um, ranges? Well, you could say the risk is higher in real estate, which would be a negative, but the growth is also higher in real estate, which is a positive, and they tend to offset each other. So, for example, if you bought a hundred thousand dollar bond, ten years later, it's still a hundred thousand dollar bond. Okay, it's paying you income, but your principal isn't going up over time. Ten years, twenty years, thirty years later, it's it's still a hundred thousand dollar bond. But if you bought real estate, you know that over time, real estate tends to go up with inflation, right? And, and you bought a two hundred fifty thousand dollar house and. 10, 20 years later, it's a $500,000 house. Sometimes it happens faster. Sometimes it takes longer. But the general long-term trend in real estate is that it goes up. And why is that? Because of inflation. And and what is inflation? It's it's the basket of, of, of goods and services. And one of those goods and services is housing or real estate. And so as inflation goes up, real estate goes up and, and the and your house appreciates. So yes, there is more risk in real estate compared to bonds, but there's also more growth. So when you factor those two offsetting factors, at the end of the day, they the cost of them tends to be the same over the long term. Okay. So what about stocks? Wouldn't you say stocks tend to be more risky than real estate and bonds? And yet, they trade at the same um, interest rate or price to earnings on average as stocks and real estate? Yes, but <clears throat> I would say it's even more risky to give it a two minuses for risk, but there's also more growth. And how is that? Well, let's say you bought a three bedroom, two bath house, and over time, over the next 10 to 20 years, it goes up in value because of inflation. But guess what it does not do by itself? It does not become two houses. It does not grow into a four bedroom, three bath house, right? It just, it stays as it was, okay? Um, the only way it's, it's gonna become two houses is if you add more capital. Now stocks on the other hand, or corporations, they grow. Now they grow with inflation. Um, let's say you owned a McDonald's and this McDonald's makes a million hamburgers a year and they sell them for $3 each. So it makes $3 million a year. Over time with inflation, now they're selling those hamburgers for $4 million. I mean, $4 each. So, so they sell the same million hamburgers and they're making $4 million. So their earnings went up the value of the stock went up. But guess what else happens to McDonald's over time? They open more McDonald's. Every year they're opening another 150 McDonald's or, or more someplace in the world. And guess what? If you've ever owned McDonald's stock, let me ask you this. Have you ever gotten a letter <clears throat> or a call or email saying, hey, we're going to open up 150 more McDonald's? And as you being one of the owners of the company, you're going to have to send us a check. No. They grow the company out of out of earnings and, and without diluting the stock. That's what good, high-quality companies do. 
right? Starbucks opens more Starbucks. Nike expands into other countries. Um, Home Depot opens more Home Depots, you know? So over time, <coughs> those companies grow, not only with inflation, but organically as well. <coughs> and if you've ever worked at one of those big corporations that are in the S&P 500, what happens every, at the beginning of every year? They give you your goal, and guess what? It's 10% higher than it was last year, right? So over time, um, corporations grow. And our average, they're growing about 6 to 8% a year. Good companies are growing faster. More mature companies are growing slower. And the other thing is when you see one of those attractive ones that are growing more, sometimes you pay a little bit higher for them. But <clears throat> in a nutshell, this kind of helps understand uh, the, the relationship of uh, different income-producing investments, bonds, real estate, and stocks. So money seeks its highest and best use. So money will look at where is the best interest rate for, for their money. Is it in bonds, is it in real estate, or is it in stocks? So, and it's not always the same. Sometimes stocks are gonna be the most attractive. Um, sometimes real estate and sometimes bonds. So let's start with the bond market. Uh, at, at the start of the year, interest rates were close to zero. Powell started raising rates, and now uh, the 10 years close to 3%. High-quality corporates are in the 3 to 4 range. So right now, bonds are about here, 3%. Real estate has had a really nice run <clears throat> in the last couple of years through COVID. <coughs> Prices have been going up. Rents have also been going up. But the cap rate has been compressing. I mean, real estate's pretty expensive. Um, high quality commercial real estate is about at a four cap right now. More attractive than bonds. So money, if those were the two options, you would see money tend to flow into real estate in favor of bonds. But what about stocks? So stocks have gotten hit recently, right? Since the start of the year, stocks have gotten hit pretty bad, whereas real estate really hasn't yet. And so at the start of the year, <clears throat> or even middle of last year, interest rate, I mean, cap PE rates, PE ratios were around here. As the, as the price went down and earnings stayed the same, PE ratios got to here. And in June and July, PE ratios actually got to here. Actually a little bit under. Let me show you. So here's... Here's the P.E. ratio uh, on the S&P 500, and you'll see back in 2021, it was in the 30s. Late 20, 20, it was in the 30s. It starts coming down. So this represents about a 3% interest rate. It starts coming down, gets to about 25, which is about a 4% interest rate in September. A little bit better than bonds, about the same as real estate. Okay, so both real estate and stocks were still going up. But you notice as as the market peaked in October and started coming down, the P.E. ratio started coming down. In June and July, it got under 20, meaning it got to about a 5% interest rate uh, equivalency. And so what happened? It became the attractive investment compared to real estate and bonds. Okay, so then by mid-June, money starts flowing back into stocks because money's going to look for its highest and best use. A 20 PE on, on, on high quality S&P 500 industry leading U.S. companies is an attractive alternative relative to expensive high quality commercial inter, um, real estate and uh, you know low yielding high quality corporate bonds. Uh, it just got there in June after, as the price declined, it became attractive. So this is what we were talking about in the last video called Tina. There is no alternative. Um, 
U.S. high quality U.S. stocks at the prices they have have been recently are more attractive <clears throat> than other alternatives than than investment grade real estate, investment grade bonds, and uh, emerging market stocks, foreign stocks, European stocks, Asian stocks. Even though this isn't historically, you know, bargain basement cheap, right? On an absolute basis, it's not cheap, but on a relative to what else they can get today, four cap real estate or, or 3% bonds, it's it's the attractive alternative. So this this is why we we think that we may have seen the bottom on June 13th. So and if you understand this this uh, spreadsheet, it, it'll really help you understand money flows and 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 when an investment becomes attractive or unattractive, and and, and how to allocate to the um, safest, cheapest, most attractive. Uh, investment and how to stay away from the unattractive, expensive, and risky investments. So these are absolute, but on a relative basis, we would say 3% bonds are the least attractive, most expensive, and highest risk in today's market. 20 PE uh, stocks in the S&P are the most attractive, cheap, and safer investment in today's market. Okay, so hopefully that helps put some perspective on uh, why we're starting to like stocks again at, at these prices. I hope you have a great day.